another weekend back again together. Oh, joy of joys. I know, right? You're, you're as excited as I am. Well, I mean, I'm excited, but you're probably like, oh God, not her again. But then again, you did click on the video. It, it wasn't an accident, right? Okay, so let's get to it. This is another in my series of uh, what makes this book a classic, basically. I forget if that's what I'm calling the series, but that's what the series is about. And today I am attacking yet another children's classic because I have a lot of those. Um, this one is my another well-battered copy. Uh, but this one, this week, is Mary Poppins by P. L. Travers. Mary Poppins was first published in 1934. I do not know who first published it. I will uh, look it up and put it on the video here somewhere. My edition is the Scholastic Book Services printing from 1972, I think it is. The illustrations here are by Mary Shepard. She was a very uh, common Mary Poppins illustrator. I'll have to find out who else did illustrations. I'm sure there were others. Mary Poppins spawned three sequels. Mary Poppins comes back. Mary Poppins opens the door and Mary Poppins in the park. The last is not a straight sequel. It's not um, part of the timeline, if you will. It's just set at some point or another when Mary Poppins has come to visit visit the Banks children and they are having some time in the park and she's telling them stories and there are those magical adventures that tend to spring up when she is around. There is also a Mary Poppins A to Z book which I do not have and have not read. I gather it's a pretty basic alphabet book. So Mary Poppins the book. It is quite different to the movie. Let's explore some of those differences and Obviously, the first difference is there are no songs, in particular, in the book. You probably figured that one out for yourself. There are three servants. Three. I can count on my fingers. Three servants besides the nanny. Uh, there are the cook, Mrs. Brill, and there is Ellen the maid. They are both in the movie, but there is also Robertson A., who is kind of a man of all work. In the movie, Mrs. Banks is a housewife and mother. She is this in the book as well. However, in the movie, they gave her something else to do, which was very nice. She's actually one of my favorite characters. In the book, she doesn't have much else to do other than the duties of running the house. When it comes to the family, Mr. Banks is a lot the same. He's a banker, and that keeps him pretty busy. He is not in the stories a whole ton, and the focus of the stories is not for the kids to get closer to their father. There are five Banks children, not just Jane and Michael. There are also the twins, John and Barbara. They are older babies. Babies, but older babies. And later uh, in the stories, not in this particular book, but in the stories later, they get a little older and then along comes their little baby sister, Annabelle. So there wind up being five Banks children. In the book, Mary Poppins comes up the walk like anyone else. The wind blows the other nannies away, but she does not float in on her umbrella. Bert is a matchman, as well as a sidewalk picture artist, but these are all his jobs. He is not an odd jobs, whatever strikes his fancy sort of guy. He and Mary Poppins do visit a chalk drawing, but it is on her day off and she does not have the children with her, so they go on a date. There are characters who were given a kind nod in the movie. I like that very much as a fan of the books. There's Miss Larkin Andrew, and there's Miss Corey and her two daughters. They have more figured in in the book. Miss Corey has an entire chapter and does show up here and there other than that. She is a magical lady who has a bakery. The kids go there for gingerbread and encounter her and her daughters. Miss Lark is not magical. She is the next door neighbor, and she has a little dog who she dotes on named Andrew. Andrew is also not magical. However, as in the movie, Mary Poppins does share some words with Andrew there. Uh, there is an entire chapter focusing around Andrew and his desire to get out of the house because Miss Lark pampers him way too much. Now, in the movie, we have the bit about Uncle Albert and the laughing gas where they're all floating up to the ceiling. And there's the bit where she flies away on her umbrella. They visit the bird woman. However, this is actually a decently ordinary chapter in the book as things go. They visit the bird woman in the city and then they go home. Now, other than those events mentioned, the book is pretty different. 
the rest of the events of the chapters do not happen in the movie whatsoever. There's the Christmas shopping at the department store where they encounter one of the, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Pleiades? Uh, one of the nine, there's nine, right? Sisters, and she goes shopping for her sisters and then takes her presents back to the sky with her. There is the occasion of the full moon, which takes place at night in the zoo. There are two successive chapters where Jane and Michael are both having very bad days, and Mary Poppins teaches them a magical lesson. And that leads me to the things that did not age well about this book. This would be the chapter with Michael. Now, at least the lessons didn't involve corporal punishment or anything like that. Mary Poppins didn't play that way. She more scared the bejeepers out of them. Michael's involves a magical compass, which Mary Poppins spins, and it takes them to the four corners of the globe, more or less. And they encounter the people who live there in different countries, and they are known to Mary Poppins, and she knows them, and, and they greet her as an old friend. Now, when Michael sneakily takes the compass on his own and attempts to use it, he goes to the four corners, but the inhabitants attack him. Now, the depictions of the inhabitants are somewhat stereotypical and in places even subservient. And having them attack without provocation, it just didn't age well. Hey y'all, Future Chipmunk here. I was doing some belated research for this video, obviously very belated since I'm doing it now. Anyway, I found out that about this chapter, P.L. Travers got a lot of flack for that at the time, and she rewrote it a couple of times in order to address those. My edition is the, after the first rewriting, I believe, um, she took out apparently a few choice words that really didn't go over well, even at the time. Um, and after my edition, there was another version which took out the people and made it animals that they were encountering. Now, I do not have that edition, have not read it. So if you're an animal lover, I still don't know how well that went over. Uh, you might want to look it up for yourself. Future Chipmunk, out. Now, it still works about this book. These are stories with a moral objective. The children have to learn how to behave, but that's not the crux of the stories. These are stories to be stories. What's interesting is these are the sort of stories where Mary Poppins is ostensibly the main character, but the stories more happen around her. They happen because of her, but also around her. She is the central figure around which they revolve. She does not change. She is a static character, so she changes things around her by her presence, basically. But yeah, it's like the stories more figure into her than she figures into them. And she's not a do-gooding saint. She can be vain and get cranky and offended at times, and that's why we love her, because that makes her more relatable. But at the same time, even though she has that necessary depth, she is so enigmatic that there's that constant mystery that makes her intriguing. The great thing is that the essential mystery about her, which is where she comes from, where she goes when she leaves, and why she has to do this, is never revealed. And we as readers are okay with that. Like the Banks children, we learn to be happy enough to have her there at all, if only for a limited time. Which is a good allegory for, like, a lot of life, or even life itself, I guess. Now, there are so many stories, especially children's stories, where all you have to do is go through a door or go around the right corner, and you'll suddenly be in this magical place, or magical things will happen. This is an especially strong motif in children's stories because it easily captures the imagination. I know when I was a kid, I was a nut about stories where you go through a gateway to another world. That was the big thing. I remember my dad and I making up these stories about a little girl who would always go through a gateway into another world, and then we'd have to figure out what happened there. Plus, which for writers, frankly, this is an incredibly easy thing to write. You just come up with a magical place or some magical circumstances that are going to happen. Come up with a seemingly ordinary way to get there. 
and then institute a few rules as to why very few regular humans know about this. Like, you need to be in the company of a magical nanny, or you need to suddenly find out you're actually a wizard, or, like, climbing through the back of a wardrobe doesn't seem like it's a definite set of rules, but what Lucy was actually doing was fulfilling a prophecy, which is itself a very vague, but also very definite set of rules. Now here, in these stories, most of the adventures are fun and interesting enough that you as a reader want to experience them yourself. Now one thing I want to do, I've been trying to remember to do this and I haven't until now. Every time I do these videos, I want to examine the opening paragraph because that is your hook right? As a writer, you have to try and capture the reader with the opening paragraph or first couple of paragraphs. So let's take a look at the first paragraph of Mary Poppins. The opening paragraph consists of just three sentences. They are directions to Cherry Tree Lane. It's a quite ordinary sounding narrative about a nice sounding but quite ordinary sounding type of place. What works here is that it immediately establishes your basic locale and it sets you on the path to get there. So your journey has already begun. Not only that, but it's just a few turns and you're there, so you may as well keep going and get there, right? Since your journey has already begun, it gives you the feeling of wanting to continue with the story, at least for a little while. It also begins, if you want to find Cherry Tree Lane. This makes it sound like the narrator is responding to a question by the reader. And this puts the reader in the unconscious position of actually wanting to know where the place is, as if you already wanted to know. So you are immediately put in that position. So you want to know not only where this place is, but you want to know why you want to get there. So you keep reading to find out. It's genius. Now I'm not gonna go any further than this. It's not a deep dive, just a shallow wade as it were, but I encourage you to read the book again if you haven't recently and see what you discover about it. I hope this has been enough of a hook all by itself to get you to do that. It's kind of, kind of my objective here. So on that subject, uh, have you read all the Mary Poppins books? And if so, what are your thoughts? I want to know. So put them down in the comments and I will read and respond and we will have a wonderful conversation. Until next week, I will read books and all that other stuff and I'm sure you will too. I'll see you then. Bye!